Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? I want to come on a couple minutes early so that we can get all the technical stuff set up. So if you can hear me and if you can see me, please write yes in the chat. Okay, if, uh, if you can't see the video, then just press play, and I should be broadcasting right now. Thank you for those of you who have said yes, that you can see me. And I've seen a couple of people coming from lots of different countries. So I'm, uh, I'm here in the United States right now. This is actually my parents' house where I grew up. And put in the chat, let's just introduce ourselves, where you are from. I think I saw someone from Brazil and someone from Moscow. Where are you all from? I'd like to know. Someone from Bangladesh? Russia? Hello, who else? Bangladesh, Indonesia. Well, this is great. I love being able to, Canada, hello neighbor. I love being able to give class to people all around the world at the same time, because it would be impossible for us to all meet in a classroom, but we can meet in my virtual classroom in this live cast. It looks like we have more than 70 people, which is awesome. Uh, someone from the USA or in the USA, Belarus. Uh, this is terrific. So this uh, this is my first live cast. I Well, I should say my first live cast alone. I did one with Gabby from Go Natural English for the English Power Pack. How many of you have been on a live cast before? Write that in the chat box. I just want to wait a few more minutes so we can have more people uh, join us. It looks like we have almost 100 people. That's great. I wasn't expecting so many people. How is the video and audio quality? Is it OK? I have a really good microphone here, um, and I have a really good webcam, but sometimes the connection is not great. So tell me if the um, so tell me if the quality is OK. If it's not OK, try to refresh the page, just load the page again, and maybe it will get better. Okay, some people are saying the quality is okay. That's great. First time seeing live video. Awesome. Okay, so do you guys ever get nervous when you speak English? I know this is a problem for a lot of English learners is getting nervous. Well, I, I get nervous doing live video, so I hope you guys will be patient with me, and I hope you'll learn a lot today and give me some feedback in the chat. So how this is going to work, uh, this class is going to be about speaking English more naturally. Um, I know that a lot of my students get frustrated when you feel like you can speak English sort of, but you feel like it's different from the way a native speaker would say it. Like my husband is, he's Brazilian and he's learning English and he's about uh, pre-intermediate level. So he has enough words to communicate, but he's often not sure if it's right. Like he'll say something and then he'll ask me, uh, was that correct or is there a better way to say it? Um, if you've ever felt this way, like your English, you're not confident that it's the same way a native speaker would say it, put yes in the chat. I want to see how many other people have this difficulty. Mm. 
<clears throat> Thank you for the encouragement. Yeah, I know it's really hard to speak and feel like you're not saying it naturally. So today I'm going to give you guys a bunch of examples. Um, one thing you might know if you've taken a course with me before, or maybe you don't know if you're a new student, is that in some of my courses, there are speaking tasks and writing tasks where you can actually record yourself and send me your voice or send me your writing. And then I correct those and I send them back to the students. Now, one of the things I do, of course, I'll fix any mistakes and sometimes I'll explain, you know, the grammar rule or why I picked a different word, but I also correct things that just don't sound natural. Like they might not be wrong, but just native speakers would say them differently. And this is hard for an English learner to figure out on your own. You really need a native speaker to tell you, um, no, there's a better way to say this or a better phrase. So let me give you guys a quick example. I'm going to switch between um, the video and my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I see we've got some new people coming from Morocco, Algeria, Brazil, South Korea, a lot of Brazilians, Egypt. Houston, Texas, Vietnam, Switzerland, fantastic, Somalia. Oh, this is wonderful. Okay, let me switch over to the PowerPoint so I can show you guys some of these sentences. And I'm going to ask you some questions during the live cast. So just type your answers into the chat. Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Screen share. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? It should show a slide on the screen with two sentences. If you can see it, please put yes in the chat box. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so these two sentences on the screen are sentences I hear a lot of learners say. I have difficulty to speak English, or I have problems to speak English. Now, uh-oh, did my screen just go back? Let me, let me see if I can get that PowerPoint back. Okay. Oh, just a second. Sorry, bear with me, technical difficulties. Uh, I want to show you Okay, is the PowerPoint back on the screen? Okay, so I have difficulty to speak English or I have problems to speak English. If you say this, people will understand what you mean, but there's actually a better way to say it. Most native speakers wouldn't say it this way. So who can think of a better way to express this phrase? Give it a try, put it in the chat box if you can think of a better way to say this. Okay, I can't speak English well. That's a that's a great example, actually. I can't speak English very well. Yeah, those are both very good, very natural sentences. I can't speak fluently. I have trouble speaking English. Uh, I ha speaking instead of to speak. Good suggestions, guys. A lot of you are on the right track. So you can see some of you said some great possibilities. I can't speak English very well. I have trouble speaking English. And here are two more possibilities. I have a hard time speaking English, or it's hard for me to speak English. So those are just more natural. They sound more like something a native speaker would say. So let's practice this phrase, I have a hard time and then the ing form. So I want you to put in the chat box, I have a hard time, and then put some other activity. For example, um, I have a hard time 
waking up very early because I don't like to wake up early. Let's get some other examples uh, from you guys. What do you have a hard time doing? I'll just wait a minute because there's a slight delay between the chat and the broadcast. I have a hard time riding a bike. Great. I have a hard time in finding a job. Yeah, you can put in uh, before the ING verb, but it's not necessary. I have a hard time sleeping because I have so much homework. I have a hard time sleeping late. I have a hard time recording videos. Me too. I have a hard time putting up with my new roommate. Good example. To put up with means to tolerate. So I have a hard time putting up with my roommate means it's difficult for me to tolerate. Uh, I have a hard time writing response essay, hard time concentrating. I have a hard time learning to swim. Good examples, everyone. So this is just, uh, let me switch back to my video. Just a second. Uh, okay, are we back to video now? Good. Okay, so this is just a very simple example of how sometimes English learners say, I have difficulty to do something or have a problem to do something. But a native speaker would say, I have a hard time, I have trouble, uh, it's hard for me, or I can't. So these are just small changes that you can make to your English to make it sound more natural. And today, what I've done is I've gathered uh, about 15 different examples like this from my students speaking and writing tasks and I'll just adjust the phrase to make it a little more natural and hopefully you guys will learn some new things from that. So let me switch back to my PowerPoint. Um, okay. Okay, here's another one. I've been living here for one and a half years. This is something I see a lot of students say, one and a half years. In fact, some people ask me if it should be year or years, but there's actually a better way to say this. And that is, I've been living here for a year and a half. Native speakers normally don't say one and a half years. We say a year and a half. And this also goes for other periods of time, like don't say one and a half hours. It's much more common to say an hour and a half. Okay? So I've been preparing for this live cast for an hour and a half. This is only the case for when we have one. When we have two or three or more years or hours, then we do say two and a half years, three and a half years, four and a half years, and so on. But when it's just one, we usually don't say one and a half years. We say a year and a half. It's a really simple, small little change, but it will make you sound more like a native speaker. Okay, this is a really simple one. I always am happy. I always am happy. So I hope you're mostly or always happy. I hope you're happy to be on this live cast. What would you change about this sentence to make it more natural? I'll wait a minute. Uh, someone said they've been waiting for an hour and a half for the live cast. I guess they're, they were really looking forward to it. So yes, I am always happy. That's correct. Uh, in spoken English especially, we often use the short form, the contraction. So we don't say I am, he is. We use words like I'm and he's and we're instead of we are and there. And when you have the verb to be, right? Am is a form of the verb to be. We put the word always after it. So we say I'm always happy. I'm always happy. Now, what about this example? I exercise always in the morning. Can you see anything that we should change about this sentence? Make your suggestions in the chat.
Yeah, words like always and never and sometimes are adverbs of frequency. And okay, we've got some good answers here. Adverbs of frequency come after the word to be, but they come before other verbs. So instead of saying, I exercise always, I should say, I always exercise in the morning. So let's practice with this one. What's something that you always do? I always brush my teeth in the morning. Um, let's get some answers from the chat and let me switch back to my video. Okay. I am always happy with my family. Good. Okay. Someone, uh, what else do you always do? Give me some examples. I always drink a glass of water. Good idea. I always work until 3 p.m. I always play games. I usually exercise. Good. So usually is a different adverb of frequency, but it should also go before the main verb. I always practice English pronunciation in the morning. I always study English. I always play basketball. I always have coffee after, after a meal, okay? I always drink a glass of water, okay? We need the word a there. I always drink orange juice early in the morning. I always study Shana's uh, Shana's English lessons, okay? Um, I always listen to music. I never drink coffee after 5 p.m. Great examples. I always meditate. Okay, right. You guys, you guys got the hang of it. Okay, let me, let's go to the next example. So just to recap with that one, uh, when you have the verb to be, then the adverb of frequency goes after it. When you have another verb like work or exercise, read, listen, then the adverb of frequency goes before it. And so that's the case with always, sometimes, usually, never, um, rarely, uh, and the other adverbs of frequency. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, here's another one. This restaurant has a good quality of food. This restaurant has a good quality of food. It's not quite natural. So how can we change this sentence to make it more natural? Write your suggestions in the, in the, um, the chat box. I'll just wait a moment. Does anyone have any ideas on how to make this sentence more natural. This restaurant's food is of good quality. Okay, we're getting we're getting better. This restaurant serves good food. That's good. This restaurant has good food. Okay, we don't need the word uh there. This restaurant has good quality food. Good food, right. Okay, so you, you can see there are actually a number of different ways. I just put one example here. This restaurant has high quality food um, is a little bit more common. But, you know, high quality is, it's, it's not a very common thing. We will, when we're talking about food, native speakers are more likely to say this restaurant has excellent food or this restaurant has delicious food. Delicious is a word that's specific to the word uh, to food or to drink. You could say this restaurant has wonderful food, or you could change the sentence around a little bit and say this restaurant's food is excellent. Okay, so those are a couple of different ways. Um, let me go back to the video. Those are a couple of different ways that you can make the sentence more natural. And what about if you have the opposite situation, if the restaurant has low quality food, well, some ways you could say that is this restaurant has, um, you could say low quality food, but you could also say the restaurant's food isn't very good. It's really common when talking about something kind of bad in English to use the negative of the good thing. So instead of saying the food is bad, we often say the food is not so great or not so good. You could say the food isn't very fresh. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's common to say, you could, if you really wanna make a strong statement, you could say the restaurant has terrible food, okay? Um, decent food. So if you say the restaurant has decent food, that means 
the food is okay, but it's not great. It's like acceptable. It's in the middle. It's not great. It's not bad. It's just decent. Okay. Yep. Uh, you could say the food doesn't taste good. Okay. Not isn't taste good. The food doesn't taste good. Average quality would be the same as like decent. Okay. Um, and oh, a good, another good example. The restaurant has the best food if it's good, and the restaurant food is hideous if it's really, really bad. Hideous um, is usually used more for appearance uh, instead of taste. Uh, let's see. Um, the food doesn't taste good. This restaurant doesn't have high quality food. Okay, we need to use doesn't have instead of hasn't because hasn't would only be used for the present perfect and here we're talking about has with uh possession um so we'd say the restaurant doesn't have high quality food okay let's go on to the next example i'm really glad you guys are participating you're doing some excellent suggestions here in the chat so this is fun um sometimes it's hard to keep up with all the messages okay how about this let's say you're gonna buy a car and you're considering a red car and a blue car. And you say, I like more the red car. What's the problem with this sentence? Can you guys figure it out? I like more the red car. How should we say that more naturally? I prefer the red car. Great example. Um, I prefer the red car, I prefer the red car, I prefer the red car. I think the red car is the best. I like the red car better. Okay, good job. We normally say, I like the red car more or I like the red car better. Okay, that's a common question. Which one do you like better? Or which one do you like more? I like the red car more, I like the red car better. Or you can use the verb prefer. I prefer the red car. Now, if you use prefer, then you don't need more. You just say, I prefer the red car. You don't need more and you don't need better. Personally, I prefer blue cars, but that's because blue is my favorite color. Okay, here's an interesting one. All the bananas are not ripe. The word ripe means when a fruit is ready to eat. Okay, so when a banana is ripe, it's yellow, maybe a little bit brown, and it's nice and soft and sweet and you can eat it. But when the bananas are not ripe, then it's green and it's hard. So can you, can you figure out what the problem with this sentence is? All the bananas are not ripe. How would you make that sentence more natural? Not all the bananas are ripe. Yes, a fruit that is ripe is ready to be eaten. All the bananas haven't ripened yet. Mm, no. Ah, Cecilia got it. None of the bananas is ripe. So I would say, personally, I would say are because bananas is, uh, the word bananas is plural. None of the bananas are ripe. Okay, so instead of saying all of them are not, we usually say none of them are okay see the difference they mean the same thing but it's much more common for a native speaker to say none of the bananas are ripe here's another example i don't have this on the powerpoint but someone uh wrote to me uh all of the students did not pass the test we have all being used with not but a better way would be all of the students failed the test, right? Fail is not passed. So all the students failed the test or none of the students passed the test. So to make your English more natural, don't use the word all with the word not. Either say, um, you could say all of the bananas are unripe or all of the bananas are green. Uh, sometimes we use the word green to describe something that's not ripe or use none. None of the bananas are ripe. None of the students passed the test. Okay. Now, uh, I saw some people making suggestions or asking about most and some. Now, with most and some, then it's okay to use the word not. So you can say most of the bananas aren't ripe yet or some of the bananas are not ripe yet. It's really more common, 
uh, sorry, it's just with the word all that we try not to word that we try not to use not. So most and some we can use not. Most of the bananas aren't ripe. Some of the bananas aren't ripe. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let me just catch up with the chat. Uh, wow, you guys are really, uh, okay, so there's an interesting question. Is none, when we have the word none, is none singular or plural? Um, I think the word none, I'm going to have to look this up. It might be singular, but in common use, in everyday use, we usually have it plural when the noun is countable. So let me give you um, let me give you some examples. You'll understand it better. So if I say none of the bananas, it sounds a little funny to say none of the bananas is ripe, just because bananas is sounds odd, even if technically none might be singular. So most native speakers will say none of the bananas are ripe. Uh, none of the students are studying. Um, none of the none of the rooms were cleaned. But when you have an uncountable noun, so an uncountable noun is one that can't be made plural, uh, then we'll say none is. So none of the water is safe to drink. Water is uncountable. And um, so we say none of the water is safe to drink. None of the furniture um, none of the furniture was damaged in the move. So furniture is another uncountable noun. And so we say none of the furniture was singular. That's a really, yeah, um, you agree with the noun. Exactly. Um, let's see. Yeah, this, some of this does get a little tricky and usually it's easier to try to remember them on a case-by-case -case basis instead of trying to study the rule. Because I guess when you pay attention to native speakers saying, you know, uh, none of the furniture was damaged, none of the bananas are ripe, try to just remember that as a phrase instead of trying to think about, is it countable? Is it uncountable? Are we talking about many things? Or are we talking about all of one thing? It gets a little difficult to think about. So um, I recommend just paying attention when you hear people use phrases with none. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. Oops. Come on, PowerPoint. Where is it? Um, one moment, please. No, that's not it. Okay, bear with me while I try to find my PowerPoint here. Um, maybe I'll close it and open it again. Okay, just a second. I, I want my live stream PowerPoint. Because uh, I want to show you guys some more examples. Uh, just a second. Okay, because I've got a really good one coming up for you next. It's one error that a lot of students make. If I can just get my screen to share. So let's see, screen share. Oh, no, that's so sad. It's not... Uh, bringing up my PowerPoint. Okay, well, you know what? I'm just going to say the sentence then, okay? And uh, then ask ask you guys to what the problem is. Okay, so here's another sentence that doesn't sound natural, okay? Most of people like ice cream. Most of people like ice cream. What's wrong with that sentence? Or how can we fix it to make it sound more natural? Let me get back to the chat. Yeah, all of the PowerPoint is gone. I know, I can't figure out what's going on here, but I'll just do my best to say the sentences and have you guys correct them. So most of people like ice cream. Oh, you guys are good. Okay, most people like ice cream. That is correct. We don't say most of people. We can say most people, okay? Actually, we don't say most of 
and then a noun. We always say most and then the noun, so most people or most of the. So you can say most of the people uh, are on this live cast are participating in the chat. Most of the people in the live cast are participating in the chat. Um, but don't say most of and then the noun. So let's practice. Let's try to make some sentences. So um, let's see. Most of, OK, here's, here's mine. Most of my work is on the computer. We can also say most of and use a possessive. Most of my work, uh, most of his students. Um, so try making a sentence with either most or most of, and I will correct it. Most of the houses were damaged. Good, good one, yep. They, most of the houses were damaged in the natural disaster, for example, like an earthquake. Um, can anyone else make a sentence with most of? Most of the people like you. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet. I hope so. Um, what else? Try most of my mistakes are subtle. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And don't let those subtle mistakes stop you from speaking because most of them won't prevent communication. Most of the children in the school do well in math. Maths is the way we say it in British English. Most women love chocolate. Yes, I'm one of them. Um, most of yours cars are blue. That should be most of your cars are blue, okay? Most of the roses in my garden are white. Very nice. Um, most of, you should have most of your courses are good or most of the courses are good. Um, it's hard to understand most. Okay, so it's hard to understand most native English speakers. Remember, most of the native English speakers or just most native English speakers? We shouldn't have of in that question. Most girls like gum? Yeah, okay, I suppose so. Most people are not interested in learning a second language in the Dominican Republic. Okay, good examples, everyone. Um, let's move on to the next one. Okay, another very, very common mistake. Here's the sentence I hear a lot of people say. We went to the house of my brother. We went to the house of my brother. How can we make this sentence more natural? Let me go look at the chat. We went to my brother's house. Wow, everyone's getting this one. Good, okay, you guys are on top of it. Um, so a lot of other languages don't have this possessive apostrophe S like we have in English. Um, and like I know in Portuguese, I speak Portuguese, we would say, we went to the house of my brother. But in English, whenever possible, we use the apostrophe S. So we went to my brother's house. You can also say we went to my brother's place. Place is just kind of a general word for house, apartment, wherever the person lives. Um, the interesting thing about this possessive, my brother's house, is that we can actually have two in a row. So we could say, we went to my brother's girlfriend's house. Okay, so the house is owned by the girlfriend of my brother. We went to my brother's girlfriend's house. Now we try to avoid having more than two. So for example, it would get kind of crazy if we said, um, my brother's girlfriend's dog's um, food is very expensive. So that starts to get a little crazy. If you wanted to say a sentence like that, you would say, my brother's girlfriend has a dog and his food is very expensive. But we can have two in a row. So for example, my mother's co-worker's car uh, got stolen or something like this. Um, Sometimes people ask me, do we ever say, you know, the the house of my brother or the house of? Sometimes, uh, usually not when it's a person. So when it's a person, we have, um, we use the possessive with apostrophe S. But sometimes we will say, um, let me think. Sometimes we will say the, the economy of the country instead of the country's economy. Uh, or especially if, let me think, especially if it's, 
Well, I'm having a hard time thinking of another example, but sometimes if the noun is very long, then we will use of instead of the apostrophe, uh, the apostrophe s. Okay, here, here's one. Let's say uh, you're going to the house of a person, and this person is the director of human resources in your company. So we probably wouldn't say we went to the director of human resources's house. It's just too long because that title, director of human resources, is a long title. So we would probably just say um, we went to the director's house or we went to my coworker's house or my supervisor's house, my boss's house. So oftentimes when the title is long, then that might be a case where we change it a little bit so we don't use the possessive. Okay, I'm going to try getting this PowerPoint back one more time because I really want you to see the next one. Um, ah, PowerPoint. Can you guys see the PowerPoint now? All right, okay. Here's another, here's another example of a sentence that's not quite natural. Karen and I met five years ago and were friends until today, or were friends until now. What's wrong with this sentence, or how can we how can we change it? Give me some suggestions. Karen and I met five years ago and were friends until today, or friends until now. We want to express the fact that we're still we're we're friends up till the present moment okay i see we're friends currently we've been friends since then we've been friends for five years good examples good examples here are a couple of more karen and i met five years ago and we're friends to this day or we're still friends we use the word still uh, a lot when talking about a situation that continues to be the case. So Karen and I met five years ago and we're friends to this day, or we're still friends. And there are a few other ways to say it. As people have been saying in the chat, Karen and I have been friends for five years. You can use the present perfect there. Now, you might wonder, well, what's the problem with until today or until now? Well, until today or until now, implies that the situation was different in the past and now it has changed. So for example, let's say you were friends with Karen, but recently Karen did something terrible and now you're not friends anymore. So then you would say Karen and I were friends until now. So we used to be friends and now we're not friends anymore. So this idea of until today or until now, even though it doesn't seem like it from the words, it's often used when the situation changes. Here's another example. Let me get back to uh, my video here. Okay, here's another example. Let's say I go play golf for the first time. I could say, I've never played golf until now. So the situation is changing. Before I didn't play golf and now I am playing golf. So I never played golf until now. Or um, let's say you have a favorite sports team. Uh, one of my favorite sports teams is the New York Yankees. They play baseball. And let's imagine that the Yankees are having a great season and they're winning all their games and then they lose a game. So I could say the Yankees just lost a game. They were doing well until today. So in the past they were doing well and now they're doing badly or now they lost. So this phrase until now or until today is often used when the situation changes. And when the situation stays the same, then we use words like to this day. So um, I started working at Espresso English five years ago and I'm working at Espresso English to this day. That means I continue to work uh, at Espresso English. Uh, or still, you can say I'm still friends. Uh, oh, we have a Red Sox fan in the chat. That's the rival team to the Yankees. So they're like the, big, the biggest enemy. Um, okay, so someone asks, what about up to this day? That's Most people won't use that. They'll just say to this day. And yes, you can use currently. Um, currently, yeah, you can use it. Uh, when do we use till now? 
till now i think is the same about the same as until now i hadn't played tennis until now right so i didn't play tennis before now i'm playing tennis for the first time so till now is the same as uh until now you can use currently you can use still you can use the present perfect okay let me move on uh let's get back to the powerpoint powerpoint okay okay when i became 12 years old i got a bicycle when i became 12 years old i got a bicycle how can we make that sentence more natural if someone said that to me i would understand it but it's not quite correct i've been in new york since 2014 and i'm still here that is correct good job when i turned 12 years old i got a bicycle okay and actually a lot of native speakers uh will just say when i turned 12 because we understand from the context that it's 12 years old when i turned 12 i got a bicycle okay now there's a difference between when i turned 12 and when i was 12 okay when i was 12 that could be at any time during the whole year of being 12 years old when i turned 12 is more specifically at the time of my birthday okay so we use the word we use the verb turn in english to describe uh going from one year to another so when i turned uh 18 then i was able to vote in the u.s the voting age is 18. when i turned 21 then i was able to drink alcohol so let's turn it over to the chat uh what was something that happened when you turned a certain number of years old like when i turned good example when i turned 16 i got my driver's license um when i turned six years old i went to school for the first time because my birthday is in uh my birthday is in september and so uh let's see when i turned 12 i traveled to another city good anybody else it doesn't have to be 12 by the way you can make it any age um when i turned eight i started learning english when i turned seven i went to school when i turned 25 i passed my driving test when i turned 21 i got a job when i turned 20 i got my first boyfriend good good examples okay let me go back to the powerpoint keep keep sending examples because you know we can students can learn from each other too and i think it really helps to see more examples okay how about this one i'm graduated in psychology i'm graduated in psychology what would be a more natural way to make this sentence i'm graduated in psychology Okay, good. Some good examples. I'm a graduate in psychology. I got a degree in psychology. Um, not I graduated from psychology we don't use. Here are a couple different ways. You can say, I have a degree in psychology. You can also say, I majored in psychology. We use the word major in English to describe your concentration of studies in the university. So you can say, I majored in psychology. It's really common for um, people to ask college students, what are you majoring in? Or what are you going to major in? That means what is going to be your concentrated field of study? And you can also just say, I studied psychology at the University of California. Most people will say that and it's just understood that you finished the course of study and you got a degree in psychology so let's anybody who has a college degree um, okay so someone asked for before we do that someone asked what about post graduation so that's after you finish the regular four years of university then you would say uh, I have a master's degree or I have a doctorate in psychology so we have master's degrees that are usually two or three years after uh, regular university and then we have a doctorate or a doctoral degree which is four to six years uh, after the regular college so then in that case you'd say I have a master's degree or I have a doctorate 
Um, so let's all say what we have a degree in. I have a degree in chemistry. Uh, I studied science when I was in college, so I have a degree in chemistry. I majored in chemistry. Um, what about everybody in the chat? Let's see what our degrees are in. Anyone who has a degree, go ahead and share it. So I have, this should be a bachelor's degree. A bachelor's degree is those first four years of uh, college. Um, I have a degree in art of science, okay. Uh, anybody else? I majored in geology, great job. I have a degree in math. Wow, a lot of math and science people here. That's interesting. Uh, I have a degree in engineering, uh, linguistics. Okay, someone asked, what if I'm still in the process of graduation? Then you would say, um, I'm getting my degree or I'm studying chemistry. Uh, I'm currently studying. Uh, so if you're in the process, you could say I'm getting my degree or I'm doing, some people use the word doing, I'm doing my degree in psychology. Uh, okay, degree in information technology, economics, degree in civil engineering, psychology, I'm getting my degree, good job. Okay, excellent. Okay, next one. She's a so unfriendly person. She's a so unfriendly person. Well, we understand what this means, but it's not natural. So how can we make it more natural? Okay, we can say she is not very friendly. She's such an unfriendly person, or she is a very unfriendly person, or she's so unfriendly. She is quite unfriendly. She's so mean. Good. Mean is the same thing as unfriendly. Um, great examples. So those are some of the ones I had here, in fact. You can say she's a very unfriendly person, or she's such an unfriendly person, or simply, she's so unfriendly. So when do we use so and when, we, when do we use such? We use so when we have only an adjective. So she's so unfriendly. Unfriendly is our adjective. But if we have the noun person after that, then we would say such. She's such an unfriendly person. Another really good example is when you see a, a dog, you can say, you can say that dog is so cute, right? Because cute is an adjective. Or you can say that's such a cute dog because when we have the word dog at the end, then we need to use such. So let's practice this. Um, I want you to say something about your best friend and uh, it should be using so or such, and it should be a good adjective, right? Unfriendly is kind of a bad adjective. So my best friend is such a good listener. Uh, she really listens to me. And my best friend is so smart. Okay, so I want to see your examples. Um, let's see. If the video or audio is freezing, my friend is so sociable. You need the word is. My friend is so sociable. Uh, I'm such a good friend. Good. She is such an adorable person. Good. Such a sweetheart. Good. Good word. Sweetheart is a word of affection for someone who you really love and they are very nice. My best friend is such good company. She's such a dedicated professional. She is so kind. She is such a pretty girl. My best friend is such a hard worker. She's such a talkative person. Good. That describes my mother. My mother is such a talkative person. Shana is so cute. Aw, <laughs> thank you. Uh, such an amazing person. My best uh, friend is a good helper. Great. My friend is such a shy person. Mm -hmm. Good. Good examples, everyone. Okay. Let's see what we have next. All right, um, back to our PowerPoint. I think I'm getting better at this live casting thing. Okay, uh, I want to buy as soon as possible a new car. I want to buy as soon as possible a new car. How can we make it more natural?
you can say, okay, I want to buy a new car ASAP. ASAP is short for as soon as possible. I want to buy a new car as soon as possible. Right. Um, when we have a verb like buy, and then we have a direct object. So in this case, the direct object receives the action of the verb. So our direct object is a new car. We try not to put anything between the verb and the direct object. So as soon as possible, if we put it in the middle of the verb and the object, it breaks up the phrase and it makes it sound a little bit funny. And I think a lot of you uh, have a good English sense because you, you recognize that this doesn't sound Correct. So I want to buy a new car as soon as possible. Okay. So let's do some uh, some more examples. Okay. What do you want to buy as soon as possible? Uh, I need to buy some shampoo as soon as possible. Let's see your examples in the chat. What it, someone asked, what is the difference between quick and soon? Quick means something is fast in general, and soon means something will happen in a short time in the future. Um, so you could say, I want to buy a new car as quickly as possible, but it's more common to say as soon as possible. I want to find a new friend as soon as possible. I want to pass the TOEFL exam, ASAP. I want to buy a pair of socks as soon as possible buy some bread ASAP. Bread is uncountable in English, so we'd say some bread instead of a bread. Uh, I need to buy a new camera as soon as possible. I want to buy a flat as soon as possible. Flat means an apartment, okay? In British English, we say flat. Um, I'd like to buy a bicycle as soon as I can, okay? So when we want to use I'd like for I want, we need I'd. I'd like to buy a bicycle as soon as possible. I want to buy a house ASAP. I want to improve my English as soon as possible. I want to gain the American accent as soon as possible. Great job. I am impressed. Okay. Um, back to our PowerPoint here. Okay. Next one. This one's pretty simple. I entered into my house. How should we make this one more natural? I got into my house. Mm, we would only say that if we were having difficulty. Uh, I entered my house. Right. We don't need entered into. It's redundant. It means it's repetitive. So we could say, a native speaker would say, I entered my house. But it's actually more common for us to just say, I went into my house. OK? I went into my house. We have a similar thing with the word discuss. Okay, I see a lot of English learners saying we discussed about the topic, but you actually don't need the word about because discuss means to talk about. So native speakers would say we discussed the topic or we talked about the topic. And it's the same with enter and go into. So don't use entered into, it's just not necessary. Say entered or went into. Okay, I've got one last example, and then I'm gonna give you guys a few more tips for speaking more naturally, and I'm also going to um, talk a little bit, bit about the new course and take some questions. So uh, here's the last one. I'm going in New York on Friday. I'm going in New York on Friday. How can we make it more natural? Oops, sorry, I just got rid of the PowerPoint. Um, let me get back to it. The sentence is, I'm going in New York on Friday. What should this be instead? Going to, going to. Very good. You know, a lot of English learners uh, learn the fact that you use in with cities and countries and areas, and we use on for streets, and we use at for contexts. But with the word going, we always use to. So don't say I'm going in New York, say I'm going to New York. This applies to countries as well. So um, I'm going to Italy next summer. Um, that's not true. I wish it was. But tell me about the next place you're going to. We would say I'm going to Long Island. Um, 
I'm going to, okay, where are you going? Um, let's see. I'm going to the gym later, personally. Uh, let's see. Wait for the chat. I'm going to a pristine area on Sunday. Very nice. Some an area that is pristine means it's it's perfect and it's natural and it's clean. I'm going to visit my parents in Mexico. I'm going to London soon. I'm going to a barber shop soon. Barber shop is uh, for cutting hair. I'm going to Stockholm next week. I'm going to Paris next long weekend. I'm going to Ukraine. I'm going to Japan. For Long Island, we would say two. Going to Long Island, but if you live there then you would say i live on long island okay so uh but it's just with going where you use to i'm going to travel to alaska i'm going to start college okay now there is one exception at least one that i know of where after going we don't use to before the place and that is going home okay so we don't say going to home we just say going home so after work you say i'm going home and in this case we don't use the word gonna okay we only use gonna when uh when there's another verb after it okay so for example i'm gonna study english but when we're talking about going to a place then we don't use gonna we say i'm going home i'm uh, going to the library. Um, someone asked, what's the difference between I'm going and I will? Uh, I actually have a lesson about that at Espresso English. If you search for Google for Espresso English with going to and will, you'll find that le that lesson, okay? So uh, remember, use going to when going to places except for going home. Oh, you know, that's another good example. I'm going abroad. Abroad means you're going to a different country, and we also don't use to. I'm going abroad means I'm going outside the country. Great job, okay? Um, all right, uh, okay. So to finish, so those are about 15 different examples of just little changes that you can make to English sentences that it just makes them better, it makes them more natural. Um, this, the previous sentences, not all of them were wrong, it's just that it's not the same way a native speaker would say them. And so you might be wondering, well, what's the best way to actually improve this? Like, you know, besides these classes, what can I do to improve my English so it sounds more like a native speaker's? Well, the first thing, honestly, is to pay attention, you know, you probably listen to a lot of English podcasts and maybe you watch YouTube videos or TED Talks. I really like TED Talks for um, learning English. And just pay attention to the way that words are used. So, for example, if you always say uh, it depends of the weather and you notice that in an interview someone says it depends on the weather then you think hmm maybe i'm not supposed to use of i should be using on so just pay attention you know when you're listening it's easy to get really nervous and frustrated and just you're worried about getting everything at once but just kind of take note don't just listen to something once um, listen to it several times and pay attention to the phrases that are used take note of anything that the native speaker says that maybe is different from how you would say it and it doesn't always mean that your way is wrong actually because like we saw in today's lesson there are a bunch of different ways correct and natural ways to say things um and in my in my courses i try to give you several ways so in everyday english speaking the first one, uh, there will often be several different ways. For example, to order uh, a cup of coffee, you can say something like, can I have a small coffee? Or you could say, could I have a small coffee? You could also say, can I get a small coffee? So all of these are common and, excuse me, they're all used by native speakers. And the other way that I suggest to help make your English more natural is just to get corrections. Now here's the thing when you're talking at work or maybe with a friend a lot of native english speakers won't correct you because first of all 
they're embarrassed and they think they might make you feel bad. And so they're not going to stop you and say, wait, 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 you, you're, you said going to home and it should be going home because they're your friends and they just want to talk with you and they're not going to correct every little part of your English. But the downside of that is that you could be making some of the same um, mistakes or having some of the same unnatural sentences and it could become a habit and you don't know that they are not natural. And so if, you're, if your friends won't correct you, then how can you get corrections? Well, one thing that I always recommend is joining uh, a conversation exchange. If you Google conversation exchange, you'll find websites where basically you partner with someone who's learning your language and then you get together on Skype or you chat and you spend half the time talking in your native language and you help the other person and then half the time speaking in English and then they'll help you. And the purpose of that is to practice and also to correct each other. So, you know, even if you don't, if you or the other person don't know the rules, you can still identify what sounds strange in your native language and the other person can identify what sounds a little odd in English and you can just help each other improve um, each of your languages and uh, the other way you can get corrections is to join one of my courses which includes this uh, correction of your spoken English so what are the courses I have that include this this ability well one of them I have two which are called everyday English speaking everyday English speaking level one focuses on really practical things in day-to-day -day life like getting public transportation, going to a restaurant, um, being in, so in social situations, um, things like even arguments or interrupting people, giving encouragement. And at the end of every lesson, there's a speaking task where, for example, let's say the lesson was about arguments. I'll ask you, tell me about the last argument uh, that you had with someone and record your speaking and send it to me. And my new course, Everyday English Speaking Level 2, also has this. Now, what's the difference between 1 and 2? Uh, level one is a little easier. Uh, the conversations are a little simpler and they're more directly focused on day-to-day -day situations. Everyday English speaking level two is more advanced. So the conversations are really full of phrasal verbs, um, idioms, slang words, um, just informal expressions that we use all the time and there are a lot of them in the conversation so this might be more similar to a conversation you'll hear just between friends or something like that and uh so it's more challenging to understand but that means you'll also be able to learn more of these expressions and then at the end of each lesson also there's an opportunity for you to record your speaking and send it to me for um correction and i why do i do this you know recording the speaking and sending it instead of live lessons well because first of all i can correct more students speaking than i can do live lessons and it enables me to really go line by line and correct everything sometimes when i'm speaking with someone live um I don't correct everything because it would just get annoying, you know, if there's a if there's a problem in every, every sentence, I don't want to stop the person every sentence and correct something. But if I have a recording, then I can analyze it and I can make all the changes necessary and I can always I can also explain it to you so why do we say it differently? And so you can learn from those corrections. And I also think that when I ask students to record their speaking. It's low pressure because nobody else has to hear it. If you don't like your recording, you can um, delete it and try again. And uh, you know, you're just sending you're just sending it to me. It's private. It's just between me and you. So the corrections I send you, um, you know, I'm not giving you a grade. There's no pressure. I just want to uh, help you improve your English. So um, right now. Uh, there's a there's a promotion there's a discount for the second level of everyday English speaking that course has 45 lessons and it's gonna be $45 but if you buy it now or before um, September 1st then the price is $30 and so if you want more information on that you can click 
under this video, there's a green button that says more information. And then there's a blue button that says sign up now. And under more information, there is uh, a description of the course and there are sample lessons. So you can actually see what this these lessons are like. And in the sample lessons, you can record your voice and send it to me. So, you know, if you think you would benefit from this, go ahead and give it a try and I will send you back my feedback. So um, now we've got about, let's see, uh, 10 minutes left. Guys, thank you for your participation. It's been really fun. And I'll just take a few questions uh, from the chat. So um, let's see. Let me just catch up on the chat because there have been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of, there's a lot of chatting going on. Okay. Um, first of all, you're welcome. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this live cast and I hope to, I hope to do this again. I hope to do it more, more often. And, uh, yeah, it's a little difficult being on live video, but if you guys enjoy it, I will do it more often. Okay. Um, so where to send where to send your recorded voice go ahead and click on the green button more information and then click on the free samples and then download the free samples you will see where to send it um you're quite welcome i i do not have italki i'm sorry i just i i highly recommend italki for speaking with native speakers and uh and teachers uh but i don't do it myself how to speak continuously with, I think you meant without hesitation. So, well, first of all, remember that it's normal to pause when you're speaking. You don't have to just keep speaking blah, 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 and never stop. Like right now, sometimes when I'm talking, I'm pausing. So it's okay to speak with pauses. Remember that speaking fluently doesn't mean you have to just constantly talk. Now, the biggest tip I have for speaking without hesitating is to learn to think in English, okay? Because it takes time if you're translating from your native language and you're also kind of worrying about, is this the right word? I'm not sure. Um, learn to think in English. And also, don't worry too much about mistakes because if you get too hung up on mistakes that means if you get too obsessed about the mistakes then you're going to hesitate a lot but i even though this lesson was about correcting those small subtle errors in your english i really think that communication is the most important goal so even if it's not quite correct it's more important to just get it out there and talk and communicate than it is to be perfectly, perfectly, perfectly correct in every single little thing. So those are my two tips. Learn to think in English, think directly in English without, um, without translating and don't obsess about the word choice. Just get it out there. And um, if there's a miscommunication, you can work it out, but don't uh, let that make you hesitate. Okay, um, for problems in pronunciation, Pr pronunciation is really, I always say it's like going to the gym and you're not going to, if you practice pronunciation, just like if you go to the gym one time, you're not suddenly going to become super muscular after going to the gym one time. You have to do it over and over. And so in the same way with pronunciation, you've got to practice it every day over a long period of time. And I highly recommend shadowing, which is where you get a podcast or a video or any sort of audio of a native speaker talking. You play the first line and pause it and try to repeat it immediately after the person. Now I have a course on this where you can, I pause the audio and give you some space to repeat so you can do that naturally but i've had other students do it with barack obama's speeches he's a really good speaker you can do it with any audio just play the first line pause it and try to repeat immediately and another way you could do it after you've um done that a couple times is try to say it with the person so try to actually match their uh their speaking rhythm and pronunciation um you can it's best to do this if you have the transcript of course so you can be reading along at the same uh speed as the person is talking okay uh so those are a couple tips for pronunciation as for listening someone asked about listening a couple uh okay just a second let me take care of a issue in the chat 
Okay. Um, okay. Someone, someone asked about listening, listening. I also recommend listening multiple times. And the first time you listen, try to get just the general ideas. Don't try to get every word. That's a big mistake. So the first time you listen, just try to get the general ideas. The second time and the third time, then try to get more specific because the more times you listen, the more details you can fill in. And my listening course, uh, will help you do this as well. Uh, so someone asked if they should sign up to this course separately or if it's included in the package which they already have. Um, please email me privately. Just uh, go to the contact form and send me a message and we'll get that worked out for you, okay? Uh, someone has asked if I recommend reading newspapers and articles <laughs> from magazines uh, allowed help in speaking. Yeah, I think they do because the first step in speaking is actually getting the confidence to speak. And so when you speak, there are two things that are going on. There's the physical difficulty of actually pronouncing the words, right? Because it's different from your native language. And then there's the mental difficulty of trying to think of what to say. So when you read aloud from a newspaper or a text, you are building your confidence in that physical aspect without having to think about or invent what to say. So I recommend it as a confidence builder, but I think you need to do more than that. For example, after you read the article aloud, then imagine that someone asks you, well, what did you think about the article? And then practice speaking aloud and just giving your answer spontaneously. Um, that chat from that says you are the best teacher from Lori is from my mother. Hi, mom. She's watching my live cast. Uh, do we have any other questions? I have time for one or two more. Is this video going to be available later? Yes, it's being recorded. And as soon as I'm done, it'll take me probably a couple days to just clean up the video and get it all set up. And I will send it out by email. Uh, someone asked about how to best remember the words. I have a tendency to forget. Um, if you have to go, don't worry about it. Uh, I will send out this whole recording later, but let me just answer this question about forgetting words and phrases because it's really common. Um, two things you can do to remember words and phrases better. One is to write them down in a notebook. So I always recommend that students keep a vocabulary notebook. So you're not just looking at the words. If you look at it, then, you know, maybe it just leaves your mind uh, a little later. But if you write it down, write down the word, write down the definition, and write down a couple of example sentences, that's a more active way of, of putting the word into your memory, especially if you can create your own example sentences. Like if you just uh, learned the word um, sunglasses, okay? Then you can make your own sentence that says, when I go to the beach, I always take my sunglasses. All right, so create your own examples. And then after your words are in the vocabulary notebook, don't just leave them there and forget about them. Maybe a couple days later or a week later, go back and review those words that you learned. So when we, when we learn something new, naturally it can kind of leave our mind over time, but if you come back to it, then it will stay more strongly in your mind. And especially if you're working with it actively. Um, oh, did we lose the video? Um, can you guys see me? Oh dear. Hmm. 